Welcome, Wargamers, to the Ballroom Blitz of the Mortal Realms, because today we are talking about Dawnbringer's The Mad King Rises, Book 4 of the Dawnbringer series, and Part 2 of this book's coverage here on the channel. Now, in our last video, we left on quite a cliffhanger. The Crusade in Ghirian had split up a bit. Its leader, Marshal Thorian, the Dame of Leaves, met up with Astria Soulbright, who's on her own, you know, vampire hunting side quest, and they came up with a plan to navigate the region of Ghirian, known as the Neck. They were drawn into uh, the view of a majestic castle that sits at the center of all these valleys, and the Crusade broke up in smaller groups to get around it. As our named heroes approached the doors to the castle, a most curious thing happened. They were greeted by honored guests of the castle. They were greeted as honored guests of the castle. There were tons of ghouls that ran up to greet them, and one mysterious vampire figure, who had a long snake familiar coiled about her. Who this person is and what's going on is the subject of today's video as we continue to follow the Guran side of the Great Twin-Tailed Crusade. Now, one thing I'd like to add up top here, if you're interested in this video, this game, this series, any of this, please consider using any of the affiliate links in my link tree down below. You'll see exactly how much money you can save with each and every one of them, and using those links goes a long way to supporting me, my wife, this channel, our cats, all of it. It's life-changing stuff, and I am deeply thankful to each and every one of you who does. Also, as AOS 4.0 was recently announced, I'm going to throw out a, your attention to Goonhammer, who's going to have all kinds of tactics articles and kind of get you caught up to speed with what's changing in the new edition. So, our team is brought in to this beaten up castle, and the scene that's described in here is, is just awesome. It's the stuff of pure Warhammer. Imagine walking into the ruined Great Hall of a castle. But instead of long feasting tables, it's simply a straight line of gore, limbs, and corpses. Skin is hanging from the walls in a twisted vision of, like, heraldry flags. All of this meat is rotting, so the whole place smells putrid. And if you've ever gotten a big waft of decomposition, you know how awful that is. And noticeably, whatever is happening here is deeply affecting the troops. I remember we mentioned the last one, Astria is really taking note of what's happening to the human elements of her force that's with her because she's kind of using them as a barometer to figure out what's actually happening. The humans here seem to know that they're in danger, right? No one looks comfy, but what their eyes literally see is shifting in both major and minor ways. For example, those flags flicker to skin. The table flickers into corpses. Screams kind of intermingle and dip into music and song. So it's a moment by moment that they feel like their, their, their minds are kind of being pulled into this delusion. The key to survival here, and for this next little part, is you keep your eyes pointed on the ground. Because as the guests all sit around the quote-unquote people table, in walks the man himself, Usherin. Mortark of Delusion. And I will be honest with you, I reread this section a few times. I do feel like they gave him a suitably grand entrance into the story. He's weird, he's snarling, you see him and he still has this beastly silhouette in the doorway. The cloak is just like raggedly hanging from him. It depicts his confused state. He talks about himself in the multiple first person and so on. It was great. And he presides over the dinner table and he just, again, continuously, warmly greets his guests. And he's asking them questions like they came over for a dinner party. Like, tell me, what's going on on the other side of the neck? Are people still doing their funny things in silly ways? Like, he's just asking them all these fun questions about current events from kingdoms that no longer exist. And Astria, who's defended, you know, her mind in an arcane way, she's not falling for any of this, but she indulges him. She's noting how weird it is, but she's playing along. And the conversation is just hilarious, because you have Ushran who's like, So tell me of ye travels, O weary wanderer. I long so for the news of the world abroad. And she's like, Why don't you tell me about this big line of dead bodies, yo? Like, their conversations are not on the same level, but she will answer his questions and pose them herself. And the chat is interesting, and it's here that I wanted to point out a little bit more about Astria Soulbright herself. 
Her mission in this particular instance that she was dispatched for is that she's looking for a mythical figure called the Somber Paladin. Think of uh, the, the resources she's been able to find, the little bits of lore that she's uncovered, makes this character seem like a lord of death who somehow rejected Nagash in order to rule justly. And of course, Astria being the person who hunts down vampires to learn more, all about like the magics of life and death, would be keenly interested in a lord of death who rejects Nagash, and so she's looking for him, hence she's here. Now when she mentions the name, the Somber Paladin, Ushirin becomes exceptionally distant. And there's this weird, I don't know, there's a tonal shift in, in the, the imagery we get for here. And basically he becomes very dour and says, such was our title in ages long past. Like I said, he always uses the multiple self, plural I should say. And he looks super sad and after a bit of contemplation, he turns to make an address. Basically he gets up to give a speech. Now it's at this second that I want to pause our story. This is an important scene because it shows that even Usherin, the epicenter of all this madness, can be reasoned with. His delusions are not inherently violent, even you know in his presence where they'd be strongest. Where Astria was expecting jeers and insults and a beast, she was respected and greeted and invited into discourse. So I like this scene because it matches the absolute horror of, of everything going around them with this uncanny civility. But the reason I wanted to pause here is because this is where the party starts. There's a sidebar in the book that covers the next part and offers some context. Basically, the vampire we met earlier, the snake lady, uh, is an emissary of Neferata, the Mortark of Blood, and her name is Sekra. Sekra's job is to keep Usherin soothed and calm. These interlopers have begun to disrupt that peace by reminding him of his previous lives, his trauma, his titles, all this kinds of stuff. She wants them gone. She's watching Astria talk to Usher and is like, I don't like this. Next to her is the Honorable Gore Main, the smaller named character we got in the Flesh Eater Court update. And now he's looking at the same situation. He doesn't like these, you know, these guests coming in and chatting up his boss. But he also really doesn't like this vampire lady at all, but because he's really protective of Usherin. He's the enforcer of Flesh Eater Court law, which forbids them from turning on these guests of the king. But they reason together that if the guests were to attack, the Flesh Eater Courts could do whatever they wanted. And so the two seem to be in cahoots. Let's just work together, let's get rid of these humans, and then whatever business as usual they had before, we can get back to. At this, Sekra casts a mind control power over the chief engineer of the Cities of Sigmar Force, that one we talked about before who cleverly came up with a way to beat the Osiric Bone Reaper walls. She pulls out her pistol and she shoots and fires at Usherin right as he gets ready to make his proclamation that we were talking about. That's why I paused it. He gets up to speak and address and be like, I want to return as the somber paladin and immediately takes a bullet for it. So now, unpause. There's a gunshot, and what was once a mad but cool and collected soon turns to absolute insanity with murder and flaying. And there's really three stories from this moment that we need to follow, okay? this, Like I said, this breaks into utter carnage. We need to follow the vampires of New Lamia, meaning all the people working for Neferata, and thereby Sekra, the Stormcast of Astria Soulbright, and the Mortal Dawnbringers. You can throw in a fourth for the Flesh Eater Court, really, if you want to. But that shot rings out, and the court, that whole room, goes into absolute chaos. Now, Sekra's watching, but immediately notices something is wrong, right? The whole plan was, me and these Flesh Eater Court guys, we're going to get rid of these interlopers, these humans that have come in. We'll get back to business as usual. But she notices that all of the Nulamian representatives, all the vampires that are part of the Soul Blight Grave Lords army, if you will, are getting torn to shreds at double the rate that the Dawnbringers are. So she turns to Gormain to be like, what are you doing? Who has vanished and she's immediately attacked by a haunter courtier. She does the math real quick and realizes this was a trap. The Flesh Eater Courts allowed these guests in. Gormain pretended to bend his rules to allow the Mortark to be hurt 
so the fracas would cover the flesh eater courts purging the vampires of their court. This is like a whole side quest that we haven't really gotten into. And if you watched my series on the flesh eater courts, I mentioned it heavily there. Essentially, Neferata has a plan to steal Usharun, the Mortark of Madness, all of his blood, and spread it around to create a little undead magic crazy cells all across the cities of Sigmar. She siphons little bits of his blood here or there. It's sold to opulent cities as king's blood, and it starts to seed insanity all across the realms. That This emissary group, led by Sekra, was there to keep him chill while siphoning off his blood for that purpose. At some point, Usharan caught on and staged this grand theatrical thing as an excuse to kill all the new Lamians. And so, in this weird way, the Dawnbringer Crusade in the book called Dawnbringers became nothing more than side characters of trapped machinations of vampire feuding. Which is kind of cool. I love that they were just wrong place, wrong time. Sekra tries to call out to her new Lamian brood. They run for the tunnels down below, but they're intercepted by Gormain and a bunch of courtiers. Uh, they fail to stop her. She escapes. Uh, they have all the kinds of contingency plans and stuff. Like I said, I'm going to do a full video on Sekra. She deserves it because her escape from this space is amazing, but it takes a bit to explain. But rest assured, she escapes and will be back. The point is, uh, Usharun has shuffled off the yoke, at least temporarily, of vampires siphoning his blood. At least without his consent. So that's Sekra and, and the new Lamians gone. The next story is the Stormcast Eternals under Astria Soulbright. Basically, when the shot was fired and she saw Usharun run away in pain, Astria Soulbright decided to chase him. She wanted to know what his proclamation was about to be. Was this the somber paladin she's looking for? Does he know where that is? Whatever it was. You know, if there's still a reasonable person under there after all, we can work together. And really, as she cornered him and, and found him after he was injured, all she got was a dark chuckle. Usharan at this point was cool, calm, and collected again. He acknowledged that the somber paladin was a mask he once wore, but he is a man of many masks. He basically announces what we've already discussed. This whole thing, you know, hey, I'm so sorry I had to use you guys. I just needed to get rid of the new Namians and you seem like a really, you know, convenient way to do that. I'm sorry for whatever happened. And he points to a pile of moldy books in the corner and says, you know, you came here for arcane knowledge. If you want it, take it. And as they do go to get the books, he goes absolutely ballistic. I guess maybe they didn't understand it was like a come take it if you can instead of like an actual invitation. But Ushran goes mad. He hucks um, Astria's Dracoline like it's a fastball at them. He shreds them apart. Uh, he starts eating Soulbright before she can even zap all the way back to Azir. I mean, she does. It's not like she's consumed soul-wise, but still, it was vicious and fast. And lastly, the human elements that were left back in the Grand Hall when the Stormcast ditched them are still being led by Marshal Thorian. They've had uh, some Stormcast Eternals of their own who immediately began acting as a rearguard for the mortals. And at this point, Thorian has ditched the cannons, the few slates, anything that was with that particular party that would slow them down. And they're just bolting out of the hall, trying to get away from the worst of the fighting. Because remember, this party starts and immediately all the vampires start murdering each other. The engineer who uh, fired the shot is dead. But everyone else is still trying to wrestle with what exactly is happening around them right now. As they're making their way towards the exit, they're all stopped by Gormain, who gives pretty much the exact same explanation that Astria got before her death. But Gormain's a little bit more, I'm going to say, honest about it. The Dawnbringers were used as a means to an end to get rid of the leech-like new Lamians. And while the humans were used as a pawn in that game, meaning the engineer, they weren't responsible for it. And so... The Gormain, being a just person within his own moral reasoning, says, you guys are going to go ahead unharmed. And <laughs> the Giran side of the crusade, our main characters, leave immediately. Presumably they grab all their gear, uh, and they're going to be meeting up with the rest of the crusade on the other side of these cliffs. And that's really where the scene ends, and so let's take a step back and talk about why is this cool. First of all, there's a lot to cover here. I love the idea that all of these crazy AF people just fooled the ever so clever new Lamians. 
the dramatic scenes were a lot of fun. Uh, they invited some wonderful sidebar stories. Like being dropped in the middle of this Mortark drama was very intriguing for me. And I got into this book, you know, I knew that Neferata had plans. She's been using his blood and I was curious to see how that was going to be depicted. Because I like the idea of him being an unwitting pawn, but I didn't want his character to be so divorced from reality that it's like he's incapable somehow. Or he's not doing fun things, he's just kind of being the recipient of punishment. Instead, we got insight into Ushran as a Mortark. He's still scheming, seemingly growing in reason and rationality as his mind comes back together from being inside of the prison that Nagash had him in. Or at least cobbled together enough thoughts from his various masks or mentalities that present as a cogent character. In that moment, he was a character who knew what he wanted, and I like that. Those moments of lucidity where it's like, we need to fix this problem, and he finds clever solutions for it that no one saw coming. I will say, it was kind of funny that all that actually happened to the crusading gear in this book was that they hit a roadblock, and they split up. Some of them went to a bad dinner party, and the rest moved on. The book even very briefly touches on other parts of the crusade here. Right? Most of them had to fight off monsters and flora, but they generally fared well. Because I imagine only Thorian's crew is really relevant to the ruse of the Flesh Eater Quartz. And really, only one crew reported making it to the other side unscathed. And they did so because they recalled drinking from a beautiful pond in the middle of the neck. Meaning, to those of us who know what's going on, while the Crusade itself didn't suffer a ton of losses here, they did lose their main engineer, a bunch of cannons, and many have been touched by the madness of the Flesh Eater Quartz, either by direct contact or by drinking some of his ichor that exists in the water. So this is a blow to their mentality, if not actually their ability to function as a crusade. Now I want to end this scene with a few, I'm going to call them post-movie credits here. Teasers and stuff like that I want to lay out. Uh, one is just a call out. Corgus Cole is in communion with uh, his god of corn in Akshi, and an underling tells him that Hammerhand is seen nearby. Cole instructs him to set a pyre so big that it can be seen from Mazir, and essentially he's trying to set a trap to lure Vandis in, and we know Vandis is sort of headed that way. The other cutscene is something real interesting. It follows um, the story of different Ossiarch Bone Reaper emissaries. One that was chasing down Thorian's remaining army, they are given full orders to halt, fall back to the nearest defensible perimeter, and secure it. What's important about this note is that it comes from the Mortark himself. We're talking Catacros, and it is faction wide. Everyone, universally, stop your advance and dig in. What this means is that he knows something is going on, but he doesn't explain what. The other side thing uh, has to do with Manfred von Karstein. It's sort of Ossiarch Bone Reaper related. Basically, he pilfered one of Arcan the Black's scout crews of Ossiarch Bone Reapers just to steal stuff. Basically, while Arcan wasn't looking, he loots and steals stuff for fun and adventure, and I love it. And in doing so, he finds that Arcan's Bone Reapers found some weird green glowing rock, and as he interacts with it, he's attacked by a swarm of colossal rats. And friends, I was there when GW announced 4th edition, Manfred just pickpocketed a world of hurt by opening the wrong door to Skavendom. I would love to hear your thoughts on the Giran side of the Great Crusade. How do you feel about the Dame of Leaves, Marshal Thorian? She's my fave. This whole scene was great. I felt like, even though they were the main character technically, I felt like we were pawns in a greater story between the Mortarks uh, of this different death factions. And that's really cool. It made it very interesting. Like I said, the sidebars were very helpful for this for context, but it was cool. Let me know your thoughts down below and I'll be hopping into the next video very soon. Happy Wargaming.